Um, our next uh, speaker, um, he's not really a guest speaker, he's a good friend of Houston Oasis. Um, Dr. Alan Gould is better known to us as the Reverend Dr. Otis Fothermucker, who um, <laughs> is the um, this inimitable blues artist. And uh, in fact, he played, I think, for our very first uh, gathering ever when our community uh, got together. Um, but today he's coming to us uh, in a different persona. Um, I'm gonna, I, I just need to read you the bio because it's lovely. Um, born in 1947 in Oxford, England, of a mixed marriage, one man, one woman. <laughs> 1964, spilled hot soup into the lap of the Duke of Edinburgh. I, I really want to hear details of that story. 1965, began research career as a technician in a radiation biology lab. 1968, entered Sussex University. Uh, his major professor was John Maynard Smith. 1971, entered the doctoral program at the University of Leicester. 1975, emigrated to Australia to work as a research fellow in plant molecular genetics. 1998, moved to Houston to work on hybrid rice for Hans Adam II, the Prince of Liechtenstein. And 2001, began consulting and investment banking business in global agriculture. He's currently a member of the board of directors of Futuragene, in Israel, working in forestry, and he's act active in projects in Brazil, France, UK, and the US. And um, so let's give a warm Oasis welcome to our future speaker today, Dr. Alan Gould. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak to this group. Um, totally blown my street cred as a blues musician. <laughs> That's all right. Um, when I was asked to speak, uh, I wasn't sure why I was chosen because I've, I've heard some of the speakers here and they speak about weighty subjects, uh, ethics, belief, uh, religion, faith, um, philosophy, deep things. Um, I'm not an expert in anything, I'm a generalist. I like to look for links between technology, potential marketplaces. Uh, I do a lot of economic analysis at this late stage in my career. But I thought, okay, I'll talk about evolution because a lot of people who are, who have a different set of beliefs and uh, enjoy Darwinism as, as a, a very cr corrosive idea. Um, I'll talk about evolution, but from my point of view, I've always worked in the plant sciences. And evolution doesn't work without plants. More specifically, evolution doesn't work without photosynthesis. So many of you who've done high school biology will, will click onto this immediately. So I'm sorry if I bore you. But as uh, Stephanie said, this is the holiday season. I call it Christmas too. Um, so this is a very light-hearted look at evolution from a plant scientist's point of view. And then it will get into some nasty stuff at the end. And by nasty, I should admit that I'm one of the people that brought uh, GM corn uh, into the world. So <laughs> if we're going to throw something, please throw full bottles of champagne. <laughs> Do I just press the... I think so. Okay. I really used it. Maybe. We'll see. Space bar. Space bar, I think. Mm. Well, that worked. What do people think of when they hear the word evolution? Well. <laughs> they think about some version of this. I like this because it fits in with my thesis of what people really think about when the word evolution comes up. Well, <laughs> what they really think about is barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> but then some people think, well, evolution, dinosaurs, they sort of, they're interesting example of uh, a whole range of animals that died out. But then if they know a little bit more about it, um, they think, well, the dinosaurs didn't really disappear. Uh, they're probably the ancestral line that gave rise to birds. Birds. Yeah, 
Birds? Barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> barbecue, barbecue. <laughs> but then there are some people who know a little bit about my friend Chuck. <laughs> and they say, yeah, well, Darwin, uh, he had some ideas about this too. And uh, he thought that we have some kind of relationship with monkeys. <laughs> So, I love this picture of Darwin talking to a monkey now. <laughs> but this is a very bad idea. Why is it a bad idea? Because of this book. <laughs> See, Darwin wasn't uh, an anti-religious person. In fact, if you know some of his history, he grew up in an intensely religious family. But the corrosive idea of evolution really put him in a difficult position. Okay. So what did this mean for Darwin? Well, he probably burnt in the fires of hell. Which of course. So folks, it's all about barbecue. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? Didn't say anything about plants, okay? This is a wonderful uh, illustration of the distribution of photosynthesis globally, okay? The different colors <coughs> mean different rates of uh, chlorophyll concentration in the oceans and um, land vegetation index uh, on, the, on the land. Basically, this means, as it says here, photosynthesis captures 115 gigatons of carbon every year. 115 gigatons, that's 10 to the 9. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. And you can look at some of what that really means. This is the rate at which photosynthesis captures energy globally. A watt is a rate of energy, a joule per second. And photosynthesis captures energy six times faster than humans use it six times faster than humans use it, globally, okay? For me, evolution is all about the flux of energy through the biosphere. But if it's just energy flux, it doesn't do anything. You have to have information storage stored in DNA and RNA and proteins. You have to be able to self-replicate which leads to an increase in biological complexity and most importantly, competition for energy. That's what selection is all about, it's to do with competition for energy. Okay. So how did all this get started? These little buggers, the cyanobacteria. The progenitors of the cyanobacteria had photosynthesis well established 3.5 giga years ago. There's that word giga again, 10 to the 9. Okay. 3.5 times 10 to the 9 years ago, the progenitors of these had photosynthesis going. And you probably realize that oxygen generation is the critical defining event for the evolution of life on Earth. Oxygen generation. That's what it's all about. So when did all that start? The great oxygen catastrophe. Before oxygenic photosynthesis took place, there was a form of photosynthesis that did not generate oxygen. Photosynthesis just is to do with the splitting of electrons and protons, and using that split, electrons negative, protons positive, to drive biochemical processes. Initially, that was done without splitting water to generate oxygen. It was called anoxygenic photosynthesis. But then the cyanobacteria came along, right about here, which caused a big problem. It started generating oxygen. Most of the oxygen was absorbed by the oceans, um, but eventually, it it outgassed from the oceans and started building up in the atmosphere. Big problem, because all life, virtually all life up to that point, was anaerobic. 
and anaerobes can't stand oxygen. So the cyanobacteria were responsible for the greatest extinction event of all time. It wiped out all of the anaerobes, or almost all of them. There are still a few left using non-oxygenic photosynthesis. Remember, oxygen is a waste product, so you're all breathing a waste product. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that most people know about. It. The, uh, the uh, theory of symbiosis as a driver in evolution, starting off with a prokaryote, took in aerobic bacteria so that they could start respiring aer aerobically. The cyanobacteria were the progenitors of chloroplasts, and eventually you've got a plant cell. It can photosynthesize, it can respire, it can build all the molecules it needs. Animal cells are pretty wimpy damn things. They can't do the photosynthesis bit. So that drove all of evolution. Photosynthesis drives evolution. No photosynthesis, nothing. Absolutely nothing, okay? This is how photosynthesis works. I'll go very quickly through this. It's basically just pumping electrons up to an excited state and then letting them cascade down through a bunch of proteins, developing energy, and ooh, ATP, uh, the important molecule generating um, energy in mitochondria. It's a two-stage process. Again, the electrons tumble down and make NADPH, which is again an energy source for driving metabolism. These are all called the light reactions. I'm going to talk a little bit about light reactions and dark reactions. These are the dark reactions. Calvin cycle type dark reactions basically use an enzyme called Rubisco. Rubisco is the most abundant protein on Earth. There's more Rubisco than any other single protein. It's in all photosynthetic plants. And it's called C3 type photosynthesis because the first molecule that appears is a carbohydrate with three carbons. Okay. For a long time, everybody thought this was the whole story. But then Hal Hatch in Australia and his buddy Slack found another kind of photosynthesis that actually produces the first carbohydrate as a four carbon. The reason it does this is because Rubisco, which gets CO2 and fixes it, is a very sloppy enzyme. At high temperatures, it will bind CO2 back and split it and let off oxygen, which means that you've lost energy. This type is very efficient in warm, dry environments. Although it's energetically inefficient, it still produces more ATP than C3 can. There's another kind down here. This evolved first, then this evolved, then this evolved. So there's three different kinds of dark reaction. Why is this important? It's important because of the grasses. <coughs> Human evolution was driven by grasses. Okay? Why was it driven by grasses? It's a complicated story that I'm not going to get into too much. The whole point is, the grasses shown here are either C3 or C4. Round here, the cradle of human evolution, the C4 grasses moved out into the plains, which enabled the evolution of the ungulates, basically deer-type animals that could be hunted by humans. So the progenitors of humans up until that stage had evolved in an, in an arboreal situation. The evolution of the grasses allowed them to move out of the forests into the plains and become hunters rather than just scavenger gatherers. Okay. So the interesting thing is, I don't want to go on too much about this, C3 and C4 plants fix carbon at different rates. There are two kinds of non-radioactive stable carbon. C12, most common, C13, less common. C3 plants don't accumulate very much 
C13, sorry, C, C3 plants don't accumulate very much carbon-13. C4 plants do. So when somebody eats a C4 plant, you can look at the bones of the animal millions of years later and figure out whether it was eating C3 or C4 plants. If you look at the non-hominid lines, looking at their teeth and their, their bones, and you do a C12, C13 comparison, you see that they were all C3 eaters. When you look at the hominid line, at a particular stage, you see the ratio, the delta 13 carbon ratio, go up. Because they'd started eating grasses that were C4. Okay, so the interaction between photosynthesis, two different kinds of dark reaction photosynthesis, and human evolution is extreme. If the grasses had not evolved, <coughs> We'd look a little different now, I think. So. <laughs> Marijuana's not grass. <laughs> <laughs> because marijuana is a dicot. Okay? It's one of the solanaceae. It's related to potatoes and tomatoes. My great ambition before I retire is to find out how to cross marijuana and tomatoes. <laughs> Think of the culinary possibilities. <laughs> this is just a, an example that I've worked on personally. Um, not necessarily the evolution of maize, that's corn, but it's a great example of how evolution in plants takes place. Um, the plant over there is Tiacinti, uh, Zia diploperennis. And it was the progenitor of modern maize. The big difference, uh, the big evolutionary step, was the separation of male flowers and female flowers. The progenitor of, of Zia uh, Diplo Perennis had a complete flower with male and female parts. But through selection uh, by uh, Mexicans, basically, they selected plants that had separate flowers, and that evolved eventually into corn. And this has got nothing to do with this presentation, but it's so damn beautiful, I just can't help showing it. This is from a friend of mine called Jim Birchler at the University of Missouri, who uses fluorescent DNA tags to light up maize chromosomes. These are not maize chromosomes, but they are relatives of maize. And uh, you can see that different fluorescent uh, dots light up. I, I just think this is incredibly beautiful. And I wish I wasn't so old so that I could have done some of this in the lab. I had to use radioactive probes to do this years and years ago. Now you can do it this way. So that's got nothing to do with it. But it's so bad. <laughs> <good. laughs> and I'm going to speed up so that you don't uh, miss your lunch. This is my favorite, favorite slide of all time. I think Stephanie has already seen this. This goes back to the year that Abe Lincoln was assassinated. So it's data that goes back that far, okay. 1865, and it's the average corn yield in the US by year. And I'll just tell you what happened in terms of humans getting into the selection and production of a plant species and totally changing it, okay. Down here, you see this is a flat line goes out to about 1925. We're probably looking at about 30 bushels an acre. That's nothing compared to modern day yields. Zia diploperennis would be down here somewhere. These were called open pollinated. You basically save the seed and planted it the next year. Save the seed, plant it the next year. Then scientists at Cornell University, around about 1925, figured out how to make hybrids was fairly clumsy, they were called double cross hybrids, but immediately the yield started to take off. And then round about end of the 50s, they figured out a more efficient way to make hybrids called single cross hybrids, and bingo. Took off like a rocket, okay? Releasing the genetic potential that was already here, but these are not hybrids. All you people in the room are hybrids, okay? 
And then, the GMO era. Now, we're out at 2013 now, average yield is about 175 bushels an acre. So this is all to do with human intervention on the genetics of a particular species. I love that slide. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> As I said, I'm one of those evil people who ran a lab that helped to introduce GM corn. The methods we used were primitive and have now been superseded. I often upset my colleagues by saying, I think transgenic GM corn and other GM species may be just a spectacularly successful flash in the pan. Because other technologies have come along, which mean you don't have to insert foreign genes to get the same effect. I won't go into this, but my prediction, and it doesn't matter because I'll be dead in 50 years, is in 50 years, transgenics will be seen as very interesting primitive technology. And there'll be other things out there for people to protest about and complain about. <laughs> so, this is the worldwide output of maize, that's corn. You can see the US is hugely uh, productive in corn. And corn is a C4 grass. Not all grass is a C4. Rice is a C3 grass. As I said, C3 is much less efficient in high temperatures. There is a group uh, at IRI, the International Rice Research Institute in Los Banos, um, Manila, just south of Manila where I've worked briefly. Uh, who's interested in taking the genes for C4 photosynthesis and putting it into rice. And they think that this will lead to about 50% increase in yield in rice. I don't think that's right. From my experience here in Texas, hybrid rice increases yields by about 35%. With hybrids and putting C4 photosynthesis into rice, I think you might get 45%, 50% yield increases. That is a huge amount, a huge, huge amount. It would also allow rice to grow in much hotter, drier environments without paddies, especially in Africa, especially in Africa, because everyone says the world produces enough food for everybody. So why can't we just improve transportation systems? That's a nasty piece of imperialism. What we really need to do is to make each country self-sufficient in its food production, not grow it here and send it to them. That's not the way to do it. So this is a big uh, effort at the moment, supported by the Gates Foundation, uh, the government of the UK, and the International Rice Research Institute. So this is going to be interesting to see how that goes. However, it will be GM. <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> Photosynthesis is not equally uh, effective across all wavelengths of light. You see this? There's a trough in the middle. It's the green, the green line, the photochemical efficiency. So in these mid-range wavelengths, photosynthesis is pretty inefficient. There's a way around that that was only discovered uh, about 12 months ago. I did it again. <laughs> I'm pressing the wrong button. <laughs> How do I go forward? Just this one? Speak, speak back. There are a, a group of proteins called fluorophores. They usually come from marine algae who live uh, down in the depths where there's not much light. So these algae have to optimize their light capture uh, opportunities. So these fluorescent proteins called fluorophores will capture light energy at one wavelength and emit it at a longer wavelength. That means if you can get a fluorophore that will absorb here, 
and emit here. Mm -hmm. You see what you're doing? You're increasing the efficiency of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, one won't do it. There's one called um, M Cherry. You can go online to Amazon and buy a little bottle of M Cherry if you want. And you can put it into plants transgenically, GMO, and the plants grow faster. Why do they grow faster? Because you slightly moved the light emission um, into a more efficient part. But what you really need, this is my Israeli client, is four of these. Four fluorophores, and you're bouncing the light energy out of this inefficient area for photosynthesis up here. Big deal. Big deal. I don't want to sound like some kind of shell in here. <laughs> what do you think about this? This is a famous engraving. This is Edward Jenner. And he is inoculating people with the cowpox virus, which gives you resistance or tolerance, at least, to smallpox. Smallpox is almost eradicated because of improvements to the Jenner technique. This was the basic response of the British public. Look what will happen to you if you get inoculated with the cowpox. Pretty horrific. But there was a society that, that promoted this. There are people around like that today, aren't there? Anti-vaccination people. And it goes on. GMO. Well, maybe that's zero. Maybe that's zero milligrams. I'm not sure. Um, this is this is the kind of thing that you see all the time. I've got a collection of about 5,000 of these. And when I'm... When it's late at night and I've had a couple of scotches, I'll just go through them and laugh myself silly. <laughs> However, it's real. It's not humorous at all. Notice the recurrent appearance in these images of a syringe. That's scary, you know. It's really scary. So I didn't get much into GMOs, but I think I've given you some of the, the long history of plant evolution, how it's interacted with human evolution, especially with the C3 and C4 grasses. And I've given you a glimpse of what people can do to actually manipulate the, the basic efficiency, the physical efficiency of photosynthesis, which as I said, is a big deal. So thank you for listening. I hope I haven't gone over time. Thank you. <laughs>